It's July 31st, 2013, and this is Arizona Mining Review. I'm Lee Allison at the Arizona Geological Survey and serve as your host for this monthly show. We're doing things a little differently on this episode. Uh, in our previous shows, we've been live. Uh, and we've run into a few technical glitches where we've lost the phone communication or the video went out or there's been another problem. So now we're starting to film some of our segments in advance and putting them together to avoid those problems and we're packaging them. We're still broadcasting this uh, live on the internet and we're recording each episode so it'll be available typically at the end of the day on our YouTube channel. But starting off as we normally do, we've got Niall Nemeth, the head of the economic geology section at the Arizona Geological Survey, uh, Skyping in from Phoenix and giving us an update on some of the, the big developments in mining across the state of Arizona. Niall, good morning. Good morning, Lee. Where are you going to take us today? What's, what's new and exciting that you want to fill us in on? You know, I'd like to just start with some broad opening remarks, kind of looking back over the first half of the year, and then later we'll get to some details. So I've been hearing lots of gloom and doom for most of the people that contact me. A large part of the reason for that is that copper prices are significantly lower than we started the year. Back in January, we were seeing in the $3.70 per pound range. Today, we see the price bouncing around uh, $3.05, $3.15. Uh, hit even harder has been the gold price. At the beginning of the year, we were seeing $1,700 per ounce. Today, that's you know been down to the mid 1200s a little better today. The other thing that people are complaining about, especially the junior companies, they're having difficulty uh, raising funds, capital. Parts of the reasons for that are the lack of uh, significant discoveries, the higher costs that we're seeing, especially uh, some of the large major producers are struggling with those. And then also we've just got the typical summer uh, sluggishness in the market and people are waiting for the Canadian field projects to come back with those good results. Yet despite this, uh, there's some opportunities and some encouraging trends in Arizona. Uh, we've got a lot of projects that have been ongoing for some time that have had capital or continue to get enough capital to go forward. Those are uh, drilling to increase reserve definitions, early stage uh, planning and permitting projects, uh, some projects are far enough along that they're going through their uh, preliminary economic analyses or feasibility studies. Also creating opportunities are uh, some of the contrarians and bargain hunters. They see these low prices for companies and people that may not be able to keep their properties as opportunities. Uh, we're seeing some of those start to come in from some junior petroleum producers. Uh, we're also seeing Arizona being recognized for our uh, development, having a low cost infrastructure uh, we're also, relatively speaking, uh, they recognize us for our mining friendliness. Well, Niall, let me interrupt there for a second because uh, there was a story just out on the, the front page of Northern Miner uh, talking about Eurasian. And I think the theme of it was that despite Arizona being such a mature province, you would have thought that all the big copper discoveries have been made. They're pointing out that Arizona still is uh, a land of uh, great exploration potential. And uh, I think that the, the, the huge article, uh, front page. Uh, what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, it was nice to see the uh, Northern Miner put an Arizona project on the uh, cover once again. That's the current issue, by the way, or that would be the uh, probably the July fifteenth dated issue. Uh, they were very proud that they were able to pick up a major porphyry copper molly molybdenum project merely by staking it. So they didn't have to go out and buy claims from somebody else. They were able to just go stake this uh, as, a, as a greenfield project. Yeah, pretty pretty amazing. As you say, given how many uh, claims are in Arizona, some you know 40,000 plus, and all the uh, individual prospectors through major companies we have uh, holding land. OK. Well, I know there's been a couple of recent developments here, some significant things. Uh, I understand Curious Resources uh, got some good news on their uh, their Florence Copper project. Uh, can you fill us in? Can if we can go back for maybe just one second, it might be worth uh, noting or highlighting the reason for the uh, story oh. by Eurasian okay. was that with funding for the drilling by their major partner Valet, they were able to uh, drill about 3,000 meters. Uh, most impressively, out of their seven-hole program, they had a 900 uh, vertical meter hole that with the uh, credits for the copper and the molly, 
averaged uh, about a third of a percent copper over that entire hole, and they had some uh, fairly interesting intercepts from the other holes. So read, read the story for all the details. Okay, yeah, I guess I didn't see the back part of that story yet. So, okay, thanks for that, those details. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I'd asked about uh, the, the Florence project. There's, there was a significant uh, uh, development there, I believe. Yeah, a couple weeks ago they announced that they had received uh, approval for their amended aquifer protection permit from the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. And had that had been challenged in the courts, hadn't it? You know, I think either the challenge or, or some of the public comments on the previous permit had caused DEQ to review the permit. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, we'll have to see where the next step is. Uh, that was one of the things, big steps moving forward. So it sounds like uh, we may expect some announcements from Curis here pretty soon about uh, what their next steps are moving forward on that project. Well, uh, the other big news I think that's, that came out this past week was uh, from uh, the U.S. Forest Service uh, at the Coronado National Forest. They released their preliminary administrative final environmental impact statement to the cooperating agencies to review. And uh, the Arizona Geological Survey is one of those, I think, about 17 agencies that's now in the process of, of reviewing that. Uh, we have until the end of the month to get our comments back to the Forest Service, but uh, you're part of the team that's going through that. What are some of the uh, issues, the, uh, the topics that, that you and your colleagues are taking a look at that in that uh, EIS? You know, some of the areas that we have either particular expertise or interest in are obviously the uh, geology. Some sub-facets there are the issues related to the paleontological and karst protection that's required for the project. We're also, uh, because of some of the far-ranging activities that we have and do, we're going to uh, touch on the aspect of how tourism is affected by having a major mining project in the area and then drawing back to some of the work that was done uh, by Mines and Mineral Resources, we're going to focus on some of the potential uh, economic impacts both to the United States and in particular to some of the Arizona counties, Pima, Santa Cruz, and Cochise. Mm. Now, I know uh, some of our viewers may not realize this, but uh, you joined the survey two years ago uh, as part of the merger between the Geologic Survey and the Department of Mines and Mineral Resources, but before the merger, uh, your agency had done, I believe, two different reports looking at the environmental, or I'm sorry, the economic impacts of the mine. And on our first pass through on the EIS from the Forest Service, it doesn't look like either one of them was included. So um, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, those are added back into the package, aren't we? Uh, I certainly hope so. It's something we plan to, to make sure gets addressed. You know, that may just have uh, fallen through the cracks by, uh, you know, not seeing mines and minerals uh, show up. Maybe that mm -hmm. line item got scratched off and, right. you know, the accompanying documents or reports uh, failed to get attention. Okay. Well, we've got, I think there was some great information in those two studies that uh, uh, you and your colleagues uh, 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 organized back then, so we want to make sure that those are included in the package. Uh, yeah, and if people hadn't seen those, you know, we still maintain the uh, mines.az.gov website, so they can hit that and look for our special oh. reports, and they can read those. Right, so we have those online, so those are still publicly available. That's great. Hey, um, when we started off, you mentioned the, the drop in price of gold has been pretty dramatic. Uh, it's had a huge impact around the world, but I know we have uh, a couple of gold mining operations uh, in Arizona and a couple that are, that are underway. Uh, what impact has had that price, impact, or price drop had on, uh, on gold production and gold activity in Arizona? You know, we've had uh, Joe Bart switch from Northern Vertex on last month, mm -hmm. and we know that they're uh, going ahead with their first phase, which is kind of a, a pilot heat bleach to test some of the metallurgical recovery up at the Moss Mine in uh, northwestern Arizona, up uh, in the Oatman District. More recently, we've just gotten a uh, monthly update from American Bonanza on their Copperstone project. I've been noticing that they've uh, still been, uh, their board has still been approving some capital fundraising they were looking for uh, between five and ten million dollars so so clearly uh capital costs 
and, and uh, the requirements are still ongoing. So, uh, but they're they're in they're producing now, aren't they? They're they're getting some good results. They've been in production for uh, a number of months now, and I think they were pretty pleased with their current June report. Uh, if we look back, say over the last three or four months, they've seen nearly a doubling of the number of ounces of gold recovered. Mm. That's largely been due to uh, improving the grade. They've got more development tonnage being produced. I suspect they've got better access to good grade faces. Okay, so they're they're hanging in there at least for the time being, even uh, despite all of that uh, global turmoil and prices. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. They seem to be doing pretty well, and they're on a the good trend. Okay. Well, Niall, I think we've run out of time here. Thanks for the updates. Uh, uh, I think the list of, of other uh, pre-production copper projects that you've compiled there is impressive. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to come back on future shows here and take a look at more depth, uh, in more depth at some of these projects, maybe get some of the uh, folks in from these companies and talk about what they're doing as and giving us uh, a little more details on the updates. So once again, Niall, thanks. Uh, we'll look forward to talking to you uh, again next month in the next episode. As always, thanks, Lee. Well, joining us today is Fred Banfield, the founder and chairman of Mintech Incorporated, a Tucson-based software development firm. Uh, Fred, thanks for joining us on the Arizona Mining Review. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, let me offer congratulations first on getting the President's E Award for Exports. Uh, only company in Arizona to get it, and one of 57 nationwide. So what is it about Mintech that puts you guys in this world-class category? Well, I don't know, world class. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty, pretty impressive. Well, I guess a lot of uh, we got the award, I think, because a lot of our business is overseas. Okay, um, we're in the mining business, and that's a global business. And uh, we're in our particular area. There's only about three or four companies that do what we do, and uh, okay. in order for us to compete with them, we have to be every place in the world where there's mining, safe okay. mining. Right. Okay. <laughs> Well, now your main software products incorporate geology, engineering, modeling, planning. Has that really been the key to your success, or is, or what are the other parameters there that really have put you guys in the lead? Well, we started out being uh, mostly consultants, uh, auditing mm -hmm. reserves, calculating, doing feasibility studies, but we developed the software for that, and so we gradually found there was a life was easier selling software <laughs> than working 20 hours a day doing uh, consulting work so we uh, we became a software company with we still do some consulting we have okay. several dozen people that work on consulting jobs and we probably have a hundred technical people in our company that provide services to our clients wow well, now, when you started the company in, in 1970, and I understand you started it in your apartment. Right. And uh, But today you've got offices in seven other countries. You've got sales reps and, and technical mm -hmm. reps around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but the headquarters is still in yeah. Tucson, and the bulk of your staff is here. Yeah, we have a little over 100 people here in Tucson. Okay. And we have 250 worldwide. And um, most of the offices have opened to provide support and training for our clients. Uh, Santiago, Lima, Perth, Australia, uh, Johannesburg, and London. I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have some agents in uh, right. China, Thailand, and, right. uh, and Brazil. Yeah, I saw that you had Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, China, Mexico, Peru, South Africa, Thailand, the United Kingdom, and, yeah. and it looks like uh, from your website, I see training classes going on all, all over the, the world. Yeah. So how's it changed from uh, from an operation running out of your apartment to a global <laughs> empire like this? <laughs> well, I, I guess technology's changed in our business every day because in the beginning we we didn't have computer graphics. We printed. Printed, uh, made maps by printing them on printer paper and pasting them together and coloring them. Okay. And now we have uh, very sophisticated three-dimensional graphics. And, right. uh, and um, but all these tools require more effort to program. So 
we, we write, our applications take longer to, to develop okay. than they yeah. used to. That was one of my questions, because starting in 1970, I'm thinking back to the computer capabilities, mm -hmm. and then, you know, there were a handful of big, giant computers scattered around mm -hmm. universities and some research centers, so how do you start from there? And so, I guess part of my question is, I'm looking at your mm -hmm. modeling mm -hmm. software now, it's incredible 3D visualization mm -hmm. and integrating all of those things. Um, where's the technology going with this? Are, it sounds like as the technology's mm -hmm. expanded and increased, it's given you opportunities to do things you've mm -hmm. never done before. So where do you see things going as the technology gives you more capabilities here? Well, there's actually two sides to that question. One side is, how do we ensure that what we do is correct? Um, because with the computer, we have the ability to make very impressive displays, but sometimes the visualization and isn't if it isn't carefully reviewed, it may not okay. be accurate. And so, it's like writing a report. With a, yeah. a lot of the tools we have today, we make beautiful looking reports, but they may not be any better than they would have been on a carbon paper right. 20, 30 <laughs> years ago. And but there are some new techniques we've uh, been using. There's one thing we found in the new uh, new technology called uh, radio bias function that allows us to build mathematical models of geologic uh, shapes just from the drill hole data. Really? So, uh, yeah, it's quite exciting. Okay. It's uh, it, a tool that allows people to very quickly visualize what could happen or could be represented. Because in our business, what we're trying to do is take three-dimensional data, which are basically drills or sticks mm -hmm. of data, and build some kind of interpretation of what happens between them. And as a geologist, you know that there are multiple ideas on what goes on. Yeah. So this is a way of building some different models of what goes on very quickly. Okay. Now, you've just recently posted something on your website mm -hmm. talking about soft geologic boundaries. I guess that would be partly related to this. Yeah, this tool. and that's, that's what struck me. And it was a term I hadn't heard before, but as I read what you're doing with it, I think it's it's the same thing, or yeah. it's it's part of that same problem. And, and can you elaborate a little bit? I think the concept was new to me, and I suspect a lot of the folks who are viewing this are going to ask, what is a soft geologic boundary? Well, actually, it's a good question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm not sure where you saw it, but... But yeah. basically, in, in, in uh, modeling uh, mineral deposits, we're more interested in the grade than the actual geology often. Okay. And so the grade boundaries sometimes, uh, uh, we assume in this modeling that they once, once uh, you go across a boundary, things change dramatically. In other words, uh, a fault, right. that's a hard boundary. Okay. But then there are other things when, uh, say, uh, in an uh, oxide sulfide deposit, when you gradually get down into the sulfide material, that'd be a soft boundary because it's gradual. Okay. And so okay. we have mathematical methods to treat both kinds of cases. So it sounds like in addition to the, the computer developers, uh, programmers, you're now getting mathematicians and statisticians and a lot of yes. other expertise. Yes, we stuff. have uh, originally myself and another fellow wrote most of our programs. And we're mining engineers, right. not computer programmers, though we think we're quite clever at it. But, <laughs> but we found that as we go on, a lot of the tools we use are fairly more sophisticated, uh, geostatistical yeah. tools and um, um, optimization tools. We use some uh, mixed integer programming, linear programming, uh, dynamic programming, and so a lot of tools that uh, require significant mathematical backgrounds. Jeez. Okay. So. so can you t talk a little bit about the staff makeup you have of, of the 100 people here in Tucson or, or the 250 yeah. worldwide engineers, we, geologists, yeah. mathematicians? But We have other? probably about 60 to 70 people that are mostly programmers because so they develop the software. And then we have about 100 people spread over all the offices that are uh, engaged in supporting our clients okay. and doing training. So we have a call system, a support system where they can call and get support anywhere in the world very quickly. And you're probably having to do that in more languages these days. Oh yes, we have 
we have a lot of capabilities in different languages, especially Spanish, because we have a lot of South American clients. But we have everything from Russia, Chinese, um, Portuguese, and so on. Okay. But uh, but mostly, most of our software is all in English. Okay, sure. That that's probably globally the case with with all of us dealing in yeah. technical areas. What where do you see the biggest changes coming in the mining industry that you're trying to respond to or try to deal with? What are the demands from the industry or requirements that, that, that's helping drive where you're heading? Mm, well, we go through areas where different things become important. The last 10 years, one of the biggest things has been uh, uh, validation of results or auditing because of uh, about 12 years ago there was a significant problem where a mine in uh, Indonesia was uh, uh, expected to have res well, reserves that weren't there because this is of the, somebody the Briex, Briex. Uh, scandal. Right? So since yes. then, there've been some a lot of regulations and uh, and so a lot of the work is finding ways to validate or support the uh, the results. Okay. And uh, or audit them. That's one thing. And uh, but yeah, a lot of work we do is beginning to go out into other areas, mostly linking with the rest of the. Uh, enterprise computing systems where we, our data flows up to the rest of the company so that the uh, everything gets integrated into one f right. information chain so to speak from one end to the other so we can make sure that we do things that help to make the, the right. process be the best. And so then it becomes even more critical to have that transparency or the, the verification because if that's incorporated into a company's system yeah. It it's easy for it to become a black box. Yeah. And they're bringing their data in, their their software, and all of a sudden something's coming in from you, and they may not where, realize where it's coming in. Yeah. And if there's a problem there, it affects everything else. Yeah, you put your finger on a very significant problem that we have, and that we feel that we're, we're kind of at the center of the raw data. We have the mining, okay. the geolo geology, and the great estimates, and then we take and do reconciliation. And this information goes to the goes to other places to be used to evaluate uh, things like like well like in the pit when they blast uh, the fragmentation has a lot to do with the recovery in the mill and so so if we can track that the the uh, pattern the powder usage and everything and then go and then link it to data from the plant we can improve the process. So, but okay. all of this data is only good if it's well verified, right. and uh, that's always a problem. Okay, I can see. Especially that. with computers, we can gather, we can gather, well, just like the, the government's doing, we can gather an awful lot of data, but the analysis of it and finding the anomalies that actually exist is what one right. of the biggest problems. Well, the old adage of garbage in, garbage yes, out. that's still that. very true. Very much so. It, yeah. Perhaps even more so than it I, has been. Yeah, it is because right. back to what I said about uh, auditing results and visualization, yeah. uh, the results can look very good until you look closely, and the computer allows us to make the pretty pictures. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't take away the fundamental requirement for people to think, and that's kind of the, some of the things. As an older engineer, <laughs> right. I spend a lot of time trying to emphasize for our our uh, staff that. Uh, right. That, that don't don't just plug numbers into the computer. Right. Think about it. Right. And for our generation, we were the guys who had to do the the slide rules or the pencil and paper out there on the site, <laughs> and you right. actually had the numbers right there, so you, you knew what That's you were right. working. That's right. We we knew how to do it by hand. That's right. But now a yes. lot of the new people have never. They don't even know about planimeters and slide right. rules <laughs> and <laughs> yes. even desk calculators. It's all yes. done with uh, software tools. Yeah. yeah. So. I was looking at your the blog for the company, and it was it was quite interesting. You have there some of the uh, the standard things that a company blog might have, mm -hmm. which is, hey, we have an exhibit at this trade show, yeah. or here's our training course over here. But there were also pictures in there of staff out on a bike ride, yes, or in a, a tug of war or something at county <laughs> fair, and uh, yeah. reports here and there. There was a great one about your last birthday party there. Oh. <laughs> And that so there's a real sense there that there's that the company is still uh, 
kind of like almost like it's run out of your apartment still. There's a, a real sense I got of, of, of kind of a small, closely knit staff. And, and I wonder if you want to make any comments about just even though you've got what, 350 people? 250, on the yeah. Or 250 <laughs> on the payroll. But there. we may. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we try to. It's a difficult thing as a company grows to make sure that you don't change the culture and, yeah. uh, and to um, make sure we're all on the same page. So. Mm -hmm. That's one reason we spend a lot of time, the senior people traveling to our offices all over the world because okay. we want to make sure everybody's uh, on the same page. And it's um, spent a lot of time on that okay. and, uh, internally. And, you know, our objective is not only to do the best for our clients and give them the best software, but also to provide an environment for our workers to uh, progress and, and have a good life. Certainly comes across that Enjoy way. Enjoy yeah. themselves. So, yeah. Well, that, that's obviously part of your success formula there is great products, yeah. but also it looks like a really great team and a great place to work. So, Why don't we try? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Fred, thanks very much for coming in. This has been really uh, very exciting. We're, we're excited to have this company in Arizona, in Tucson, and it's one that I think a lot of people didn't realize you were here. Uh, you're probably well known all over the world. But I don't think most Arizonans realize that this is a center of, a, of you know, one of the, yeah. the leading companies in the world in this area. So. Well, there are quite a few other companies here, too, that are, yes. that are this is a center right. of a lot of mining yeah. technology and consulting. Right. And, and I think uh, people in the state hear about the big companies that may be mm -hmm. mining, but they haven't heard about the infrastructure mm -hmm. that's behind them, mm -hmm. supporting them. And I'm hoping we can uh, showcase more of your compadres here on, on right. the show and talk about just this, this other side of the mining industry and what it brings to Arizona. Okay. Great. Well, thanks well, for coming thank, on. Well, thank you for having me. My made. pleasure. <laughs> well, that's our show for today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to our producer, Mike Conway, cameraman, Jordan Matty, our design team with Arnie Bermudez and Stephanie Marr, and our IT guy, Ron Palmer. This show was recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel at the URL coming up on the screen. So we're looking forward to seeing you next month on Arizona Mining Review.